Hi there. Thanks for the great intro and for all the the uh, housekeeping warm up. And now we've got that out of the way. Um, I will start talking. And I'll just, I'm glad there's a group chat. It gives me some sense of not uh, staring at my computer and talking into the ether, but um, talking to the group review. And I'm, I'm looking forward to questions. I have 46 slides, um, so I'll go through those and probably, you know, probably we'll have most of our questions at the end. But um, just so you can track how much more he's going to talk. Uh, all right, so let's get going here. Um, and I've provided a bunch of URLs, which um, I think will show up somewhere in, in the interface that you have. And one of them is the URL on this page. Uh, yeah, the book is here, and I'm obviously excited about that. It gets me the chance to speak to you guys and, and hear what you think and hear what your questions are. Um, on the site for the book uh, is a bunch of samples. Um, so I'll, I'll get to a couple points where I'll say, oh, yeah, that's on the book site. Um, and so you can go in and find a sample uh, screeners and some field guides and some debrief worksheets and so on. Um, so you, you've got that to, uh, to dig up. And uh, as Mina already said, sort of the blurb about what, what my firm does here, um, I like where, how uh, everyone's indicating where they're from. I happen to have the chance to give you a visual. So here's Pacifica, California. Um, it's about that sunny today. And uh, that's where my, my business is. And so this phrase that we use to talk about what we do, that we help companies discover and act on new insights about their customers and themselves. Um, you know, one of the themes here that I'll, I'll come up in, in a couple minutes again is how do we even talk about this? How do we frame the activity of, of interviewing users, of user research, of bringing something in? Um, so what I've chosen to do is not get too specific. Um, and focus on the outcome. The outcome is being able to act on something. Not only we do, we, do we discover something, that's what we might call, quote, research, but the work is about figuring out how to act on that. I'm going to emphasize more the discovery part today, obviously, but it's all in service of being able to act on something new. Uh, and the second piece here that we not only learn about customers, but we learn about the organization themselves. I don't think there's any sort of, um, you know, platonic ideal of, a research report or a finding. It's all in context. It all starts with how do you, your team, your clients, how do you frame the world? What is it that you think that you want to do, that you want to learn, um, that, that you have chosen how to solve the problems that you believe are out there? I'll come back to this a little bit, but uh, just to sort of say to you that, that even my firm's kind of mission statements, um, and I guess technically that's not a mission statement, but whatever, our positioning, our, our tagline is really, uh, is really getting at what do we even mean when we talk about doing, doing this kind of work. Okay, onward. So let's talk a little about framing the problem, and then that kind of transfers into some of the practices of, of researching and interviewing users. So there's a lot of terms out there. I've chosen to say interviewing users. Um, that's the title of the book. We struggled a little bit about how do we even say it in the book? How do we put that title there that characterizes what we're talking about it in the right way? Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've been sort of you know, aggregating this list for a long time. It's not meant to be definitive or anything. I think at one point I went on some uh, consultancy's website and I looked at, um, you know, how they listed their services. And it was almost like, going into a Chinese restaurant and ordering from the menu where you can get one from column A and one from column B. It's just this list of, of, of activities. And uh, I don't think that's a very exciting way to talk about, about this kind of work. And really when it comes down to what do we call this, I, 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 don't, I don't care. I think, um, yes, there's a point to get to uh, methodologies specifically, but that's, that's the second or third part of the conversation. And the beginning of the conversation, I want to talk about what is it that we're doing and why. So here's kind of my, here's my definition. Here's my stake in the ground. Uh, we examine people. So examine is another sort of generic verb. I don't know what it means to, what, what, is, what are we going to do? I don't know. That means we need to determine it every time what the examination looks like. The piece I'm most emphatic about that I've bolded here is that we're going into people's context, not our context, but their context. Um, and so that's, you know, that's 
that needs to be determined what that looks like, what that means, how we do that. Um, but that's kind of a, a big anchor here. Uh, we look at a couple of things. We look at what are people doing, what's, how many, how often, what are the problems, what's their task flow. But a really important piece, and I think this sometimes gets lost when people go out and, and talk to their users, is that looking at what does it mean. Uh, so we have uh, cultural symbols, emotional symbols. We place value on things. People will talk about um, their choices, the things that they choose to do, or the things that they choose not to do, their aspirations. Uh, within all that are clues and, and, and cues that we can control with design, we can influence and impact. So understanding meaning is uh, as important than under, as, as understanding behavior. That's the first piece. The second piece is that we infer. Uh, if you like to say interpret or synthesize, that's fine. Uh, the data that comes back from the field from interviewing people and, and gathering info about behavior and meaning isn't anything until we do something with it. We have to make the connections. Research is extremely creative. It, it taps into your brain in a really amazing way, and this is where a lot of that happens. How do you make connections between things? Um, it's, it's this fairly magic, creative piece. Um, I think about the researcher sometimes as an apparatus. And you think about, uh, this is something I know nothing about, but imagine you're going to measure the acidity of soil in some field somewhere. You would take some probe and you would put it in the soil and you would leave it there and it would accumulate data. It would accumulate information and data and then you would take that probe and you'd bring it back into the, the lab or the office and you would look at what had happened to it. Well, that's us. We go out into the field. Things happen to us. We have experiences we have our own biases and presumptions and our own life experiences that we bring to that. And the, the, the delta between what we have in our lives and what we experience out in the field, that space, that's a really interesting piece of, of, of data and that, that really feeds into this, this synthesis. It's one reason why you know, doing research alone without colleagues, without clients is, is limited because you only have your experience and your delta there. And the third piece here is that we do something with it. We make something new or we make ideas or proposals about what something new could be. Uh, and we come up with more types of solutions than we started out with. So we may start out a project in, intending to make a blank because that's the department or the team that we're working with. But the implications and the way to get at what we've uncovered uh, can spread across all sorts of parts of the organization, including things that we that don't even exist currently. This happens uh, at many points in, in the development cycle. Um, you know, and this is kind of a map of where I find my, my organization working. Uh, so there's, just think about there's different sort of kinds of interviewing projects. And one is the, the uh, sort of the blue sky project. We don't know what is going on out there. We don't even know what we're going to do about it. We want to find new opportunities in a certain type of behavior, a certain market. So we look at people kind of fresh, and then we're trying to answer what to make or do. Uh, along that arrow, that, 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 that big arrow, um, you know, the, the refine and prototype, that obviously there's many, many different kinds of things that, ha that happen there. Uh, that's where teams come to us and say, we think we're going to do with this, and we want to make sure that, that this is solving the right problem or that the way that we have conceived of this uh, is, is actually going to, going to work. So, you know, it's not really about testing. I'll get into this in, in a couple of minutes as well. But the ideas themselves are hypotheses. So we may push to the left to, you know, frame, frame the problem in a fresh way, or we may also help move towards launch and kind of tighten and get specific of what the thing is going to be. And then the third one is, is that there are products that are out there already. And so when we want to understand how they are performing or what new things could exist, we have that history, we have that context of an existing product or service. So I mentioned framing the problem a moment ago. Let me talk about that a little bit and, and the, what you see redacted in the back uh, background here is uh, an actual slide from, a, I think, a trend deck that one of my clients had in there, uh, uh, a technology entertainment company, and I just I cleared out everything that could be at all um, confidential. So what you're left with is something generic. So 
you know, the specifics here aren't really that exciting. And then what I've done with these balloons is kind of make up things. So just I want to I want to demonstrate the process here. So the business question is about what is the organization going to do. Um, so the, we're learning about the, there's monetization of social networks going on. So we were thinking about what new products and services can can be made, and how can we increase uh, stickiness and drive revenue. Uh, you know, China is I like I love this here. China exclamation mark is the entire uh, trend point. It sort of says we don't have to say anything else about it, but it, it begs some questions. Anyway, China. So what entertainment activities should should be supported? And, and the, the middle class is growing, and so how do we provide tools for them or, or products for them? Again, I'm making this up, but you know it's building off of a real off of a real deck. That's the business question, and here is the research question. So things like what are the motivations, successes, frustrations for both current and prospective users of these sites? How is family life changing in China for the middle class? What are the digital and analog technologies that are being embraced now? So in the best situation, you need both a business question and a research question. Um, and, and, and there's no guarantees here. I think what happens for me a lot is people approach us with one or the other. Uh, in fact, sometimes people approach us with research methodology. Um, Steve, we want you to talk to seven users in these cities that have these profiles. And then I have to say, well, okay, what's the research question? What is it we're trying to learn? And uh, then what's the business question? And so for me, I want to draw a through line between all those. I mean, I, I don't want to get involved unless I can make that connection because it's, you run the risk of not being successful. Someone else has, has skipped some steps and kind of assigned that this is how it's going to go. Um, so depending what the entry point is for the request or as you're framing it yourself, you know, you can do top down and bottom up. I, I'm not precious about that. But to understand that both exist and that both are important um, and that, you know, the, the setting up what you're going to do involves digging into this. I hear a lot about pain points, uh, and, and sometimes that's how the need for uh, – sometimes the research question is a pain point question. What are people's pain points in doing this? Um, and it's true. If you look at people, you will find pain points. Um, but I think you can also, you know, run amok with them. So an uh, example on the right here, here's uh, – we did a bunch of research, and we saw in people's homes drawers full of – you know, uh, generation of technology that's kind of been discarded, um, and their drawers are overflowing with this. Well, the, we decided that the solution, therefore, is to give people bigger drawers. And so that's a silly example, my, and, but we've all had that experience where someone takes a data point and kind of runs into a solution from that that isn't really addressing the real problem. Uh, that is a pain point for people, uh, but, the, you know, why is that a pain point? That's a deeper thing what's going on with uh, consumption, with, uh, with marketing, with obsolescence. There's some you know, richer issues that we want to get at to understand uh, what we should be doing. Um, so again, a silly example, but I think it illustrates the point here of, of the risks of just taking a pain point lens. If you don't know the word satisficing, uh, I'm teaching it to you right now, and it's a word that you're going to just see 20 examples in the next three days that 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 reflect this idea. It's about uh, good enough. Satisficing is we're, we tolerate good enough solutions. Um, this picture here is from a, a field work a study I did uh, maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, this is a, a, a little workspace in the basement of this woman's home. The fax machine is really what this is about here. The fax machine is sort of um, teetering at the back of the monitor, and the only thing that's keeping it there is the tension of the cable that goes to the phone jack on the wall. It's about, I don't know, two and a half feet too short. It really should go behind the printer or someplace, but it's just kept there through tension. Now, that you look at that, and you're like, oh, boy, that's a real problem there. Um, in fact, this was a woman who was uh, trying to run a real estate business well, uh, going through a, a, a very recent separation from her military uh, employed husband who burst into our interview uh, in, in full uniform and kind of uh, angrily demands to know what we were doing there. Uh, so very interesting situation that she was in. Uh, oh, and a, a, a kid that was made less than a year. Uh, so she had her hands full. She's never going to fix that. 
there, I mean, we, there's a solution that exists. Uh, but if you take kind of a engineer, designer, marketer lens in that, you're like, oh, wow, people are existing in suboptimal situations, and we have to design for that. And you know, No, people tolerate that. Um, and this example here, this blog there, I fixed it. It it shows, I think, we it's what I call LOL users. We like to see where people are doing things kind of dumb and laugh at it. That's kind of a thing in our culture right now. Um, I, I, it's sort of an interesting thought exercise to say, well, let's look at that you know, nail into the wall of the curtains, and let's just, as a creative exercise, when would that be considered a good solution? You know, I'm sure we can come up with some things. So... You know, just understand the difference between what we think is painful, what we think is a uh, is a need uh, and a pain point, and what people think. They're the ones that are going to adopt some solutions. So if they uh, don't think it's a big deal, their barrier to to is is high. Their their motivation is low to address it. And this kind of thinking, I think, shows up in in some interesting places. Um, and this is, you know, here's sort of pain point thinking from Microsoft. This is an actual ad for Windows 7. There was a whole series of these. Uh, and this woman is, is saying, you know, I asked for it to use less memory, and now it uses less memory. And, and what a, a ridiculous idea here of Microsoft's uh, ad agency uh, that, you know, the folks at Microsoft are sitting around thinking, well, what, what should we do with Windows 7? What should be different? And some woman pipes up and says, hey, could you lower the memory footprint? Uh, and they're like, yeah, what a great idea. We'll run off and do that. Um, it, it, it takes the notion of user-centeredness and kind of you know, goes to the lowest common denominator that uh, the customers are making feature requests as opposed to you know, having their needs, and the customers are making feature requests in the language of the producers of solutions. And this, so you know, I'm kind of ranting about this ad maybe a little bit much, but you can see how it really flips so much of what we're trying to do around, that, that this is the dynamic that Microsoft is proposing exists between them and these, these individuals who are their customers. And so you know, I want to push that in the other direction, and, and, and we're trying to understand uh, what their experience is, not their feature requests or you know, pain points that maybe aren't so painful. In order to get to something that's actually going to be uh, enticing for somebody and, and, and have meaning for them and value for them, we have to kind of change the conversation. Uh, and this is just kind of another high-level point here. There's different methods, and you know, Viva La methods. They you can bring them together, and they they highlight different things. Um, and so, just a you know, quick example for some work that we did. Uh, and you can really tell. I mean, I can show this because it's from a long time ago, and you can see how long ago it is because here's the music listening uh, uh, penetration. Uh, I think the color bars are just different demographics, but. Uh, iTunes was third after Real Player. That's hilarious to see that now. But uh, so we did a quantitative study, uh, a partner of ours, to look at uh, some different concepts, but also just look at the baseline of what was going on out there. So what apps were applications were people using uh, to listen to music? And so that you know that points to one set of what the opportunity might be. We went out and talked to people. We saw them and their music collections, and and um, for. Everybody except for the iTunes players, they were very, you know, here's another pain point thing. Uh, they were very, uh, oh, I love my music, it's great, you know, well, show us something. And so we would have this, you know, deadly sort of 90 seconds of, of you know, uh, with a person's hand on the mouse kind of staring at the screen. Oh, okay, click, click, click. Um, mm, no, click, click, click. Um, no, okay. Mm. Eventually we would get into some folder, nested folder that said untitled album, and we would have an untitled song about mp3 which they would play and they were perfectly happy with that at that point but um the the situation with the itunes users was different their music was all labeled it had cover art it was you know properly identified and tagged and everything and they had control over it so the quality of the experience they were having and being able to access the music and thus being able to take on some of the new kinds of services that my client was exploring was very different. So neither one of these tells the whole story, but put them together, and of course you start to get a, a, a richer picture. So I want to dive into some um, some more tactical. We're going to be tactical and high level. I think we're going to straddle a little bit here. Um, and so this is a a point that seems surprising when I share it to, with, with a lot of folks. Um, who you learn from is not necessarily, if I had more space, I would say necessarily, not necessarily who you design for. Um, 
So sort of traditional market research says go for the customers that we are selling to. Uh, and, and so one thing is that you never see the customers that you could be selling to if you do that. But also, we're trying to understand things in this kind of research. We're trying to understand things that maybe we, we can't see otherwise. So getting at, to, getting at the rejectors, uh, the haters, the experts, the, uh, the, the extreme users, the people that have 27 of them and that build their own, or the people that spend all their time doing this, or the people that, that are loyal to your competitor, uh, those people will be able to articulate things that, you know, if you think about a normal distribution, the people kind of in the middle – can't necessarily articulate, and that, you know, the cliche about whoever discovered water, it wasn't fish. Right? If you're in something, you can't see it. If you're in a study and you're talking to the same people over and over, the same kind of people, you get lots and lots of stuff, but you're trying to set yourself up to be kind of jolted out of how you're looking at the world. So being able to get these different perspectives in there, and, and some of that will happen organically just because people are people, but trying to, you know, seed kind of salt and pepper um, your, your sample with some different kinds of people that will give you the opportunity to understand something different. You don't have to design for extreme users, um, but understanding how an extreme user thinks about and uses uh, a product versus how you know, a more typical customer might helps you see things that are you know, uh, barriers that you wouldn't otherwise see. So it's a really powerful way, I think, of framing a, a, an approach to a study. And just a little bit more on, on thinking about the recruiting, who are our participants. Think about the system. Um, and again, we may talk to users that we're not going to sell to. Um, they may not use our solution, but they may be providing an input to it or impacted by the output of it. Uh, just think about a restaurant and you've got, uh, you know, bartenders and, um, you know, hosts and, and servers and bus persons and people in the back of the house at all these different levels and managers. It's a whole system, and you know, anything that happens kind of flows through there and changes the experience. So customers as well. So understanding that um, is, 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 can be really crucial. And, and this discussion can be really challenging, but I think surfaces a lot of stuff about um, you know, who do we want to – who is our customer? And we had this experience uh, a couple of years ago with a – global uh, brand that's a, an apparel, sports apparel manufacturer. And they would say, we'd have these conversations that, you know, are, are, were fascinating because they would say almost, it didn't seem to be a contradiction to them. They would say, um, yes, our, uh, our customer is the high school lettered athlete who's going to go to college on a scholarship. And our website, that's we were looking at their website, 80% um, of all purchases are women between some age and some age. And that wasn't a contradiction, but of course it was a contradiction. We couldn't really, um, we couldn't really kind of break through that with them. Um, and, and so we probably spent a month trying to nail down who will be in this study. And obviously that, that it appeared to us as a dysfunction. That gap between those two was really was really, really important kind of for the strategic objectives of this, of this project, and we had to get to who are we designing for and, and, and who do we need to understand for that. So the field guide, this is an, an artifact that you prepare to plan for the field. Um, I did have an experience a couple of years ago where I was working subcontracting to another team, and I was having a lot of trouble getting any information, and we, I went out to Colorado to meet with them and kind of do a planning meeting, and um, it basically ended up with, this sounds like a, it sounds kind of strange, but it basically ended up with me being taken out to suburbia and dropped at someone's home, like, okay, you're going to go interview them, and uh, I mean, I, I didn't have a business question or a research question, I didn't have a field guide, and I, I wasn't sure sort of why we were doing that, and I thought, okay, well, this is what's happening. I kind of went with it, um, and I thought, okay, well, after that, now we've done this pilot study. Maybe we're going to get together. We never did. We had, I think, six or seven teams working in parallel. We never had aligned on uh, a methodology, what questions we were going to cover. And, um, you know, I think they started to get kind of sick of me asking them to do that. But anyway, uh, I'll just say to you guys, like, you need a plan. You need to, you need to go through the planning activity. Um, and so one thing that happens is th th there's a difference, and I think hopefully everyone here knows this, right, and you probably are telling other people this. There's a difference between the questions we want answers to and the questions we're going to ask. 
I mean, researchers don't literally ask the things we want to learn. We find ways to kind of do that. So the field guide is how you start to lay down what that's going to look like. It's a way that you share with colleagues, clients, teammates to get to, does this look like it's going to cover what, what we think it's going to cover? And the creation of it or the review of it is a pre-vis activity. You start to think about what the interview is going to look like. If you do this really well, you're set up to improvise because obviously the field is about improvising, but you've, you've kind of loaded yourself to be successful. Um, four chunks, you know, logistics, background is kind of a key one. The main body, you're going to dive into what all the, the, the topics that you've identified ahead of time. Um, three and four here, you can think about questions towards the end that are audacious. Ask people to talk about things that you would, you know, are kind of just extreme or ridiculous, you know. What, if we could come back and talk to you in 10 years, what will your this and this and this be like? It's, uh, you know, if you could, if you, uh, you know, met an alien, blah, 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 blah. These questions that are just, they're, they're about dreams. They're really pushing way forward. These are questions you can ask at the end. You can't necessarily ask these at the beginning, but people will go interesting places with you at the end. Um, and just include some of the logistics. What are the wrap-up things? Especially if you're sending other people out in the field, you want to make sure that they know how to kind of tie it up in a nice bow. You could have a very minimal field guide um, and just agree on the topics. If I'd had this in Colorado, it would have been a thousand times better than, than the nothing that I had. Um, here's just a one page from uh, a field guide, and this, I think, is in the, uh, the list of resources the, on the Rosenfeld Media book site. Uh, there's a full document of this, so you can dig into it. And so just one thing to point out here is that I've time-coded the chunks, even down to saying one minute and 14 minutes. Obviously, I'm not sticking to that. But it's a way in the planning to think about what's the weighting relative of these different conversations. Um, and then as the interview proceeds, some sense of am I on track or not? Like how much do I have left and, 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 and am I going to get there in time? Other kinds of methods that you can include in the planning. And so some of these are just um, you know, different kinds of questions. So giving people tasks, uh, asking them to draw something asking them to let you participate. Can you show me how I should do this? Uh, demonstration, show me how you do this. And so you can think about even just this example here. What's the difference between asking someone to show you to make them a teacher and asking them to show us how they do it? Those are very different. They get at kind of different aspects of it. Uh, role playing uh, things. So, you can, so just we're going to do this now. You be this, I'll be that, and let's talk about how that would go. Uh, and what you see here is sometimes I'm using quotes, they're actual questions that might go in the guide, and sometimes they're italics. Those are kind of my stage directions. Um, and so that's just a personal style. Um, you know, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily write, can we see your server room? But I might say kind of memo to self in the interview guide, look in the server room, look at this, look at that. Um, and so it's captured so we know kind of going in that it's, that it's going to be there. Some other kinds of methods and sort of approaches to the interview or just interactions with people to learn from them. Um, participatory design, um, and it, probably people are familiar with this. I think the resistance to PD, as the uh, as its advocates call it, is that it implies that we're going to just, uh, you know, before I talked about feature requests, it looks like feature requests. But there's a translation here that I think is really important. When someone says, I wish it had a handle, um, you know, we're hearing that they're saying they need to move it around. And so there's a lot of different ways to solve that. Change the weight, give it a shoulder strap, give people multiples. You know, the designers, the translation the designers do is about generating alternatives and, and, and looking at different ways that something could happen. So that's what you get from participatory design. Uh, I'm going to, just for time, I think I'll skip ahead here. Um, this, I think, is a really important point here. There's a difference between testing and exploring. And the word testing, you know, from usability, we often hear testing as, as the verb that describes an interaction with someone when we have an idea about what our solution is. Um, and, and there's a risk sort of, of doing, well, do you like this? Do you like this? I think we can go a lot richer. Um, and choosing what to show people, um, I would encourage you to choose things that will provoke a discussion about the underlying issues rather than get a thumbs up, thumbs down. So we're never going to be able to produce this tiny flip phone, right? It's, it's not usable. It's not manufacturable. It's dangerous to our ear canals. Um, but bringing that out 
starts to raise the conversations about interface, about loss, about the value of these artifacts, this isn't the only one we're going to show. We're going to have a range of sizes or a range of examples depending on what our issues are. Um, so I, I just encourage you to reframe testing and, and kind of exploring and to choose artifacts or create artifacts, especially for the research, not simply um, taking the artifacts from the design process and taking them out in the field. You need to design your methodology so that you have the right, the right provocations. Um, there's a, 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 for the second chunk here, there's a great article, um, and I, I think the URL may show up. If not, you can just Google it. It's called What Do Prototypes Prototype? And it, it, it says that we're, you know, there's really three things that you can represent in a prototype, uh, and I forget how they call it. One is the role, which is what is, what is the, if I had this thing in my life, what would it be doing for me? What problem would it be solving? One is um, the interaction, so how, what is it like to kind of go through and work with it? And the other is the fit and finish, the, the look, the, the visual. And those are very, very different. Um, and that you can't test all of those. And so you need to be, or test, again, test with big quotes around it. Um, you need to understand clearly what's your question, uh, what's part of the, of the solution are you trying to get more insight about, and choosing the example. Uh, in this case, um, uh, it's the case. Uh, for a video iPod, and I don't know how well you can see it in the picture. There's, it's this. Um, it was not stereo lithography, but it was not. A, it was like a cheap, you know, polystyrene uh, um, mock-up that had been made, um, and uh, it was meant to uh, cover the, the the video iPod and be a stand and everything. Um, and it looked like crap next to the finish of an iPod, and so people re and, and the and it was not a. a production example so you know the, the lid fell off it squeaked the, you know, the parts were not tight so really we got a lot of pushback on the appearance and no matter how many times my client said well the real one won't look like that I mean that door had closed the most important things we learned were about what the heck is this thing and why do I want one which the client had never really thought about at all so that was kind of their big takeaway but I kind of stumbled into that that issue so I try to be a little more deliberate now Um, oh, mock-ups. Uh, here's this was a newsletter. Uh, they'd mocked uh, the design firm had mocked up the front, um, and then I think there were sort of articles on the front, and the back pages had uh, that that lorem ipsum text. You know, text you just use to generate. To, and um, anyway, she, this, this, I think it was this woman here. She flipped through the, the the prototypes, and you know, we got a lot of good input. But she looked through the back, and she's like, "Oh, that's so great that you have a second language on there." Um, and, and I'm, not, I'm not laughing at her. That's like a great misinterpretation of our intent. It was sort of our failure. We took a prototype out there. You know, designers and design clients understand what lorem ipsum is, but, you know, no one else does. And so it was a real, uh, you know, what we thought we were sharing and how it was perceived there was an interesting gap there. So lesson learned, I think. So and here's just a, here's a, here's a prototype. Um, it was a DVD projector with speakers in it, and you can just see it next to the, the, the big screen TV they had in this house. Um, I think the story there was that my client brought this out to our field work and uh, checked it, uh, his, his checked baggage, probably was too big to put in the overhead, but um, when he pulled it off the plane at the end, it wasn't working, and we were driving on our way to, to do some field work, and he was uh, trying to repair it in the backseat of the car. It was quite, quite exciting. Um, so, you know, plan for your prototypes. Uh, just thinking about ranges of methods, things that you could do uh, before and after, um, so that you know, set people up to do something ahead of before you go out to talk to them. Have them take photos, fill out a booklet, have them save up something. Uh, the people that looked at that newsletter saved up uh, all their mail, and then we talked about it. Um, give them workbooks, um, bring stimuli. We've kind of talked about that exercises, and, and so part of my point here is you, you know you have not just the time that you're with them, but you can set them up beforehand. You can have them continue afterwards, and you can keep making stuff up. Um, you know, we're just always generating methods, and kind of you create a library and, and, and you know collect stories from other people. But it's it's a growing part of the practice. Um, here's just like a real quick and dirty one. I mean, it's not really a card sort. We just provided examples. This was about uh, things, uh, certain kinds of reviewing that you would do online, and so we just brought examples of sites and had people 
um, and applications, and we just kind of laid them out. And sometimes people would group them, or we'd add other ones, and it just was a, a way to make the conversation more tactile and more visual. Just quickly on culture here, um, when you're in the environment, whatever the place that you're, the context that you're going, um, you see artifacts, you see behaviors, you see things. Um, if you go into an office, you see uh, what the signs in the bathroom are like about washing your hands or uh, the advertisements in the elevator for events that they're going to have. That starts to tell you a little bit about the culture. Um, and so you get these interesting cultural cues that um, you, know, you need to pay attention to. Um, uh, and I won't, I won't do Q&A on this one, but you know, I often ask people, like, well, what do you think this is an ad for, this, this bring it on? You've got a bunch of hefty guys eating the world's largest sandwich. It says bring it on. Um, and people look at this and they think, oh, that's, that's for uh, football. That's for sandwiches. That's for um, indigestion medicine, um, which is close. It's an, this is an ad for a toilet. It's an ad for a low-flow toilet, and the flaws of low-flow toilets are that they don't adequately flush away the material. So here you've got a bunch of big guys eating a lot of food and, you know, what's going to happen later? And the ad says, hey, our toilet is, is, is ready to take this on. Um, and, you know, hopefully you're all sitting there, like, making a ew face because, ew, that's pretty gross. Uh, we don't talk about toilets like that. And so I show this example not because I want to talk about toilets, although I do, um, and I'm happy to continue that later. Um, this says that there's an edge to the norm, and you guys just felt it being pushed on, and that's advertising's job. Uh, but you in the field, you need to look for these. Where are these things that kind of surprise you or that define boundaries where what's in and what's out? Those norms ch uh, influence what we choose to do and what we choose not to do. Uh, so you need to, to keep your eye open for those kinds of things. Um, and sort of last thing here, this first chunk about you know, being in the field, Take photos. Um, you know, I'm old enough I can say, back in the day we used to take film cameras, and, you know, if I took 36 pictures, I was really proud of myself. Um, now, of course, we have pretty much infinite capacity for this. So take pictures. When you go back and look at them, you'll see things in the picture that you don't remember happening because you're so focused. Um, obviously, you want to get permission and, um, you know, have a sense of what to take. So here's a shot list. This is on the resource page as well. Um, you know, it's quite detailed. It's very visual. I don't know if you need something like this. If you're sending other people out in the field and you want a checklist, maybe somebody's role is just to be the photo taker. This would be great for them. Make sure you come back with at least these five images. Uh, the last thing here just about being in the field is, is to, is, 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 in terms of documentation, is that um, you have to capture everything that is said. You have to have a recording. You cannot, I mean, human beings can't write down everything that's being said. Court reporters maybe, um, but you can't lead an interview and think about everything that you have to juggle and build, you know, make the connection with the person. Um, it's okay to take notes, um, and some people like taking notes because it helps them process. Um, but for me, so anyway, you need a recording. You need an audio recording or a video recording um, because you need to know exactly what was said. What you think was said, what you wrote down, and what you remember differs greatly. So you need the definitive, perfect record of it. So make sure you are recording. So let's talk about some the interview itself, and I'm going to just skip ahead here a little bit. Um, there's sort of four principles I want to dive into, and this, I think, frames a lot of, a lot of field work. One, check your worldview at the door. Two, embrace how others see the world. Three, build rapport. Four, listen. I'll talk about each of those. Uh, how do other people, uh, you know, what, what's happening with your, your worldview? Um, let go of it. So one way to let go of that and, and check it at the doors, as they say, is, is to get everyone together before the project and just dump. What do we think we're going to see? What do we think about people? You can get contradictions. That's fine. Um, it doesn't matter. It's not about even going back and verifying these afterwards. It's just getting it out of your head where you haven't really addressed it and getting it on a whiteboard or on a wiki so that it's, it's physically out of your head. Now you're freed up to see something new. And that's kind of at the project level. At the interview level, you know, there's a transition ritual. When we come home from work, we drop our keys in our wallet off or our purse or whatever it is. Uh, and that sort of demarcates between one world and the other. When we leave the office and we're in you know, uh, quarterly meetings and, and performance reviews and emails and, and expense reports, 
Um, and even our project is about, you know, next-gen roadmap. Um, stop that and just say to yourself, okay, we're going to spend the next 90 minutes learning about Paul and, and frame the activity about that. All that stuff can come back later, but just be there to think about Paul and set everything else aside. And so with that, you know, be ready to embrace other people's view of the world. So one thing is we're already going to where they are, so that, that's a good start. Take all the physical distractions like eating and the bathroom and, and traffic and make sure that, uh, that that's not there. You can't engage with somebody if you're thinking about your stomach. You can't be, you can't be really, really present. Um, and the last one here is to ask questions that you think you know the answers to. This is an important one. I think, uh, you know, if you ask them when are your taxes due uh, and you think you know the answer to that and, if, you know, they're in the same country as you are, then you probably know what that answer is. But you have to be able to authentically ask a question, and this is an obvious one, but think about all the things that you're going to hear where you just skip over because, oh, yeah, 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 I know that. You have to, to create that willingness in yourself to to hear that and, and, and to be okay with asking those questions. So kind of remind yourself to be able to do that. Rapport is an interesting one. I mean, this is the connection that you have with people. Um, so social graces are something interesting, and this, this, this varies widely from culture to culture. Um, you know, for here, I think about just enough small talk. If you start doing too much small talk, people don't know what you're there for. Um, if, you, if you just walk in and immediately start the interview, that's just brusque and I think difficult for people. Um, talking about yourself, you're going to hear things that you have a personal reaction to. I love that show. I can't make that work for myself either. I love eating that food. You don't have to say any of those things. You can think them, but you don't have to say any of those things. Say things about yourself if it helps the interview move forward. I did an interview where uh, the uh, person we were interviewing um, says, um, oh, and my family's Jewish, and she just stops. Um, and so I kind of piped up, and I said, oh, my family's Jewish too. And she's like, oh, so you know. And then she went to my colleague and explained to him whatever her point was. Um, that was uh, really, really helpful, and I, it's the only reason I shared. You know, I, didn't, I, I, I knew I was Jewish the whole time. I knew she was Jewish the whole time, but it wasn't until it kind of came up. And so one thing you'll see in general when you're doing these, these, these interviews is the difference between question-answer and question-story. There's kind of a thumbnail of what it looks like in, in the picture there. Um, you ask a question, you get an ask or answer. Question, answer, and then suddenly question, story. I don't know when that's going to happen. It might be immediately. It might be an hour and a half. You have to just kind of be patient and keep doing all the good things that you're doing. But look for that moment. And sometimes you know, you'll see it and you're like, ah, finally, here we are. Listening, we, uh, we can do listening by the things that we say, not just with our ears, but when we ask follow-up questions, when we make uh, transitional statements, uh, I want to move on to something new, uh, or I remember something that you said earlier and I want to go back to that. Those tell people a lot about what you're thinking about, how, how their stuff is so important. Um, and that, 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 that supports rapport building. Um, and, and it's not how we talk to people normally. This is a difference between interviewing and conversation, one of these critical ones. Think about what your body looks like when you're listening. Not only does that um, tell the other person how you feel about what they are saying, but it also tells your physical behaviors uh, induce feelings in your, in your body. And there continues to be more and more research about how uh, smiling or frowning uh, can change, uh, you know, even depression and so on. Uh, and Malcolm Gladwell writes about uh, the naked face. He describes these researchers that uh, were trying to map muscles on their faces, uh, and they were pushing their skin around on their face to try to make frowns and smiles, and they discovered that they were feeling sad on the days that they were mapping frownies. They came home sad. Um, and so this idea that emotion goes outside in is really an interesting one. So you can help yourself listen by sitting like a listener. Here's something that I think will help a, a mediocre interviewer become a good one, a good one become a great one, and so on. Um, and this is going to sound dumb because it's so simple, but this is really, really hard. This is about being quiet, being silent. So when you ask a question, just stop the question. So here's, what, here's my example. Um, 
what did you have for breakfast today? Did you have toast or juice or cereal? Or... And, and so one thing there is putting the answers in the question. You know, and so you think, well, the person can easily say, no, I didn't have any of those. I had roast beef. But you create this kind of performance barrier for them, and you change the dynamic every time you give them a series of, of answers that you want. It implies that you want them to answer within that. The best question is to say, what did you have for breakfast? And stop. And that's very hard. That's why in my silly example I said, Err. you can kind of hear, I hear myself trail off. It's because there's a certain fear. If I stop talking and there is silence, what will the person do? I don't want there to be awkward dead air. I don't know if I have permission. So I keep going. I give examples. I trail off. I say the verbal equivalent of dot, dot, dot of the ellipsis. Um, and that's kind of a, that's, that's a hedge against that fear. Let go of it and just let them answer the question. Um, people will speak in paragraphs. They'll, they'll answer you, and then they'll stop. And if you just look at them or not, they'll keep going. So don't be like Barbara Walters and be ready at the first moment to jump in with your next question. Just let it go, and when it's time, answer your next que ask your next question. I uh, interviewed a family a few years ago uh, about home entertainment, and um, the guy was very, very proud of his setup, and his whole family was there, and my client was there, and he kept talking about Tyvo. They didn't have Tyvo. They didn't like Tyvo. Um, for people that are in different parts of the world, I'll just tell you part of the story is about the fact that the brand here is pronounced Tivo. Um, he kept talking about Tyvo, and I swear I could feel my client wincing every time. He's an engineer. He liked to do things a certain way. Um, and, you know, eventually I asked the question, and I said, you know, you told us before about Tyvo, blah, 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 blah. He answered the question. My client later on, you know where I'm going with this, he asks a question, very nice guy, very, you know, uh, compassionate, but he did what a lot of people would do. He asked a question about TiVo, and you could see the energy in the room change. Um, because now this guy who was so proud of, of, of his knowledge had been reminded that we knew more than he did. And it, it was just an awkward kind of moment, and it was hard to get the dynamic back. It's a simple thing, but just reflecting back is a really helpful technique to, to um, you know, tell people that you're interested in what they're saying, and you're there kind of on their, on their territory. Uh, if there's a pro if, especially if you're talking about your product, um, if people ask questions, they're like, oh, I wonder if there's a way to do this. I wish there was a help feature. Um, you know, I've never been able to get into this part of the thing. If you start fixing it for them, the, in the interview is over, I think, at that point. Uh, this is one of the most damaging things that you can do because then, er then they just start saying, well, will it have this and will it have that and how do you – they just start getting a house call and you have told them that you are the expert and that they are – uh, they are not. So it's okay to help people and leave them better than you found them, but wait till the end. The interview is over. You've given them their incentive check. You're thanking them. Oh, by the way, would you want me to show you how to do this? Um, and it's only about what's helping them. If you want to drive a certain kind of usage or adoption, that is about you. If they are having a problem, that's about them. So think about them. The last couple of points here, and then we'll get to some of the questions. Um, speaking of questions, here's what happens in an interview, right? The, the person, you've got an interview guide with your next question. Uh, the person starts talking. You're being really good here. They're talking in paragraphs. As they're talking, you start thinking of questions. Um, and then, you know, here, so, uh, you know, why does this matter? Let's find out what that service is. There's a lot already that you want to start following up with that first paragraph, but this interviewer is great. She just says, okay, and the person goes on and says some more. So now we've got you know, at least four questions that have been generated plus the next question in the interview guide. And so it, it quickly gets out of control if you think about it that way. So you've got to find ways to cope with it. These things will come up organically sometimes, um, so just kind of let, let it go where it's going to go. Um, or kind of just make quick notes of things that you want to come back to at some other point when it's important. Or you can prioritize. What's the most important thing for your topic? Or prioritize based on how do I tell this person that I'm listening to them so that I can you know, build my rapport. Um, and there's no sort of magic bullet here, but these are some, some mitigating tactics that I can suggest. And I, and I think... You can look at this as a negative. I think sometimes it's, it can be really cool. And so for me, I have – it doesn't always happen, but I have these flow experiences, if you know about uh, the optimal psychology and, and, and flow. Um, 
it, I have had these moments where just like the jump to hyperspace where like it feels like we're slowing down and speeding up at the same time and I can almost feel myself sort of step back four feet from the interview and with all this kind of chaos and pressure going on, I still feel like I've downshifted um, and I can kind of enjoy that um, that slight distance that gives me just, a, again, a sort of a flow state. Um, this doesn't always happen. I don't know how to make it happen, but this exploding question thing can actually be an interesting kind of gift. One of the ways that we can learn and get better is um, is about, you know, collecting stories and, and sharing them. And, and war stories, I think, are just this fascinating thing, the things that go wrong. Um, I know there's some folks that are on, that are on our session today who've contributed some war stories to this this URL here. Um, this is a, a series on, on, on our website where we've collected stories from uh, different kinds of researchers who just talk about things that happen. There's not a lot of, now therefore you should make sure this doesn't happen. I don't, we can't fix these things. They just happen. Um, this picture is about Dan Soltzberg's story, which is early on in the series about uh, kneeling in cat pee. I won't tell the story uh, since he wrote it up so beautifully. You can go and kind of read that there. But these are really great stories. Um, they are the reality of being in the field. Uh, and so I encourage you to read them. And uh, I'll just uh, make a plug. If you have one, uh, send it to me. I, I'm, I'm looking for more. It's a really great archive, I think, for people in the field to learn more from. And so with the mention of cat pee, um, I think that is probably the transition point to uh, hear some of your questions in the time that we have left. Fantastic webcast presentation, Steve. Thank you so much. And we have many questions that have come in, as you can imagine. So folks, you heard we are at Q&A. If you have a question for Steve, please open your group chat, type it in, send it in, and we'll take as many as we have time for. All right, let's go in the order they came in. Um, Rafaela has a question she'd like to know. I understand that when you're doing exploratory field research, you manage to look for things that are not satisfying. The problem happens if we are doing a more focused research and during the interviews we discover our idea, um, our pain point was wrong. Can you talk a little bit about that? Hmm, I'm trying to understand, if I understand the question. Um, our idea of what their pain point was wrong. Yeah, I, I guess I need a little more clarification on the question. I think the question might be about, um, you know, some studies are wide open and some studies are more tightly focused. Um, so let, let me take a shot at that and then maybe um, you know, I can get a, a clarification. Um, and I feel like, you know, just like when we say let's make the next 90 minutes about Paul, I think we have some leeway in how tightly we construct the problem. Um, I think part of what we get out of doing field work is that we learn that the problem is something different. I have so many experiences, as I'm sure people do as well, where we thought the problem was A and it turns out the problem is, is B, and I think we want to set ourselves up where that's okay. Um, so it's a balancing act between sort of meeting our brief and being able to find the, the thing that we didn't know that we didn't know. I mean, that's one of the reasons that you do this, is to get at what you don't know that you don't know. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Jesse has a question I would like to know. Uh, regarding other methods, do you have a formula for what methods um, to use when, or is it by the feel or experience? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I've sort of longed for a unified field theory. Um, uh, you know, you know I've, I've seen diagrams that I'm never comfortable with that say, if this, then that, or at this point in the project, do that. Um, in the book are a couple of diagrams, and um, uh, there's on the, on, the, on the Rosenfeld Media site is a link to the Flickr set, and the Flickr set has all these images. So those diagrams are in there. Um, Steve Mulder and Elizabeth uh, uh, Sanders both have diagrams they've used to show uh, sort of frameworks for, um, uh, for different types of problems and what the methods are. I don't, I don't personally, I can't work that way. Um, it is more of kind of, a, of an exploration um, and kind of just building up a palette. And, and uh, sometimes, I've got to say, sometimes we kind of make up stuff because it seems like the right thing um, and, you know, kind of, kind of go with it from that. Uh, but that's sort of, you know, it, 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 is, it is experience like, like Jesse asks. Thank you. Um, next question here from JC. Have you had any negative reactions to taking pictures or video of people? Do you ever get unnatural results because they change their behavior due to being recorded? 
That's a great question. Um, you know, back in the day, I think this still sometimes happens, you know, um, you can get these big cameras. Um, and, and, you know, I think the, the concern over the quality of the video recording meant that you came – I met people that were coming in with a sound guy um, and, you know, like a serious professional camera. My feeling is that's going to change behavior because it's pretty uh, – you know, you've got people doing nothing but filming you. Um, the devices now that you can film with are so small and unobtrusive. You know, I put the video camera on. A, I have like a little tabletop tripod made out of plastic. Um, and I just kind of sit it next to me. Um, you know, we uh, important here is we tell people when they're recruited that they're going to be recorded. We ask them to sign a form at the beginning that, that's a, a release, and it says that they're going to be recorded. They know what the purpose of it is. I feel like the props, if you will, actually work to support the seriousness of what I'm doing, that I'm not, you know, some jerk in their house or in their office. This is actually valid and is going to go somewhere. So um, I think there's a bit of theater there, um, and it kind of supports that. Now, um, you know, if you take your flash camera with the big shutter noise and you start jumping around and getting in the person's face and kind of going, G -g 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 -g, you know, it's annoying, um, and it makes people uncomfortable. So I think there's something about the way that you go about doing it. But I think, you know, it, it doesn't take a huge amount of, of kind of politeness and elegance to, to make this come out okay. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions here. Um, Alec would like to know, are there opportunities for someone to shadow researchers on real projects? Um, I'm, I'm sure there are. I think it's about, if, I think it's about finding the researcher that will let you do that. Um, I think sometimes there are uh, non-disclosure issues. Um, you know, one thing that goes on is that, you know, as, as a research agency, we have um, non-disclosure client confidentiality agreements with our clients, and then we have the releases with our participants. So um, it, just, it can be a little tricky in those situations. Um, if the question is about, like, could I bring someone to watch me do research, you know, that, that's another level of permissions that I would have to get. Um, and, you know, I would have a hard time asking my clients to let me do that, if that's what I think Alok's asking about. Thank you. Um, Amy would like to know if you have any strat strategies you can suggest for preparing clients before going out into the field, uh, especially those who don't have much experience, some do's and don'ts, et cetera. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the resource page is uh, the document that we use to do that. Um, it's a handout. Um, and you're welcome to download that and adapt it for your own use. Um, and, and what we do with that is, um, you know, sometimes this is even in the project plan. There's a meeting a few days before we go in the field, and we ask, and this is hard to do, but we ask that everybody that's going to go in the field comes to this meeting, um, and we go through this document. And it's, a ch it's also just a chance to talk about what's going to happen. Um, and so it talks about what role they have, um, how to ask questions, it, you know, it, it, it's like what we've just talked about for the last hour kind of boiled into like two or three, two or three paragraphs. I'm not trying to make them into great researchers. I'm just trying to set them up to be successful. Um, so, yeah, check that. Check that. Uh, it's a PDF. Check that out and see if that, that helps you with that. Great. I'll just reiterate. Folks, you have a green file folder looking widget icon in your widget tray. Just click on it. There's a lot of great information Steve has made available to you. So please do peek in there. All right, just a few more questions here. Um, can you shortly explain how user interviews may be used effectively in a lean project? Um, I can't, actually. <laughs> I, don't, that's, I don't tend to work within, uh, and I couldn't give a definition of what makes a lean project, um, so I'm just going to apologize on that one. Thank you. Um, David is asking, what do you think of the value of insights gained from observing different cultures, like multilingual interviews, are observations valid or reliable, or just a recognition of cultural differences? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to that. I think, um, I think, yeah, multilingual and multicultural are just are fascinating things. Um, and I think as researchers, we kind of get off on having our assumptions about how the world works challenged. Um, that's you know that's kind of the creative engine I think of of uh, of researchers. Um, so 
you know, when I'm in some situation where uh, I'm just I'm being exposed to something that's outside what how I live, then um, you know that's a gift. Um, and so that's about sort of satisfying me personally. You know, in terms of its validity, yeah, I, I think um, you know one of the, as as the world gets more global and and more of this work is being done kind of across multiple multiple geographies. Um, you know, it creates this cost challenge, and so one of the ways people mitigate this is they distribute. They have access to distributed research teams. So if you have somebody in China, they go and do the Chinese Chinese research. You have somebody in Russia, they go do that. Um, but when I've had the chance to do research in the, in cultures that are not mine, boy, is it fascinating. I mean, we see things. It goes back to whoever discovered water it wasn't fish. If you can get out of your culture, you're going to see things in China if you're not from China. Um, that the, the Chinese won't see, um, and you know, ideally, that's an interesting dialogue, uh, you know, as a you know, around insights. So, and I think that's a long-winded way of saying yes and yes and yes. I think yes, let's do that. Great. And we'll take our final question here, folks. We are at the top of the hour and going over a bit. Um, question says, I do understand about focusing on what the interview is about. However, we frame the questions and are interested in certain things. Our worldviews are embedded in that. Can we really leave worldviews out? Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's a that's a fair point. I mean, we are who we are. Um, yeah. And, and so, I mean, if you look at what I've said, I've kind of said two contradictory things. One, I've said is that we are this apparatus, and we bring our worldviews with us. And you know, we are who we are, and we see things in multilingual contexts that are going to challenge us because of our background. And then I said check your worldview at the door. Um, you know, I, I guess if we're going to try to reconcile those two things, uh, the worldview is maybe more of an aspiration. Um, you know, don't, don't, and you can think about your personal worldview and you can think about your professional worldview. Can you check your business objectives at the door? Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that person nailed it. It's not, it's not possible. I mean, in, in what situation can we ever stop being who we are? I mean, as, as human beings, we can't. Um, and, you know, it, to get a little more nuanced, you know, there's, you talk about, um, you know, when you hear surprises, when you hear things that upset you or disgust you, uh, you know, it's like what psychologists and therapists know how to do. You just, you just suspend that reaction. You suspend your judgment. You don't, you don't not judge. You just acknowledge that you hear yourself judging and you kind of set that aside and maybe you revisit it later. So that's a more wordy, less kind of, you know, bullet pointy version um, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fair critique of how I've put it, and I, and I do agree. Super. With that, Steve, we're going to say a very big thank you to you, sir, for spending your time with us today, for sharing all your knowledge and expertise. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. What a great opportunity to talk to everybody. Folks that attended the webcast today, we also say a very big thank you to you, and we hope you've benefited from it. We've had many, many people from all over the world today, so we are very happy that you joined our event. And for those of you that did send in questions, thank you so much, because having those questions just adds so much more to our events. We'd also like to let you know we did push out some good information to you all in your group chat. So if you didn't open it, please do. Good information there to save you some money. Steve's book, we have a special today at O'Reilly Media. You can get the ebook at a very, very good price. And we've also provided the URL if you'd like the print book. You can get it on the Rosenfeld Media website. So if you like what you heard today, and judging by all your comments you did, um, please take advantage of either the O'Reilly code or please go to Rosenfeld Media to get your print copy. Again, we thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude our webcast. Goodbye, everybody.